right in this session we are going to study about parotid gland before going to study about parotid gland we should know where parotid gland is located this is the area where parotid gland is located this area what we call parotid region or parotid mould or parotid bed first we should know what are the boundaries of this region that means what are the boundaries of parotid region or parotid mould or parotid bed so first we will see boundaries of this region we know that this is mastoid process this is external acoustic meatus here is a tympanic plate this is the styloid process this is the ramus of the mandible and this is the temporomandibular joint then we have already studied few muscles here this is anterior belly of digastric here is the anterior belly of digastric of course here there will be sling then this is posterior belly of digastric this is posterior belly of digastric muscle along with that there will be stylohyoid muscle also from the styloid process to the hyoid bone along with these muscles there will be one more big muscle what is that it is taking origin from the sternum and also from the clavicle what is this muscle sterno cleudo and it is inserting to the mastoid process so sterno cleudo mastoid so what is this muscle sterno cleudo mastoid muscle so this is posterior belly of digastric this is anterior belly of digastric this is the stylohyoid muscle and this is the sterno cleudo mastoid right then see here what is this arch zygomatic arch from the inferior border of the zygomatic arch from the inner surface of the zygomatic arch there will be one muscle taking origin and it will be inserting to the outer surface of the ramus of the mandible what is that muscle mesiotar muscle so here is a mesiotar for our convenience i am removing this muscle stylohyoid so here is the area where parotid gland is located now we can easily see the boundaries of it superiorly the external acoustic meatus and the temporomandibular joint anteriorly ramus of the mandible along with mesiotar muscle outside that means outer surface of the ramus of the mandible giving insertion to the mesiotar muscle inner surface of the ramus of the mandible is giving insertion to the medial pterygoid muscle so medially medial pterygoid laterally mesiotar muscle then if you see posteriorly what is this mastoid process along with attachments what is this muscle sternocleidomastoid what is this muscle posterior belly of digastric then inferiorly what is there posterior belly of digastric then medially what is there styloid process and if you go still more deeper pharynx so these are the boundaries of parotid region or we can also call as parotid bed or we can also call as parotid mould let me tell you boundaries one more time superiorly external acoustic meatus temporomandibular joint anteriorly posterior border of the ramus of the mandible and mesiotar muscle medial pterygoid muscle these are anterior boundaries then posterior boundaries mastoid process and its attachments that means mastoid process sternocleidomastoid and posterior belly of digastric medially thyroid process and its attachments along with pharynx and inferiorly what is there posterior belly of digastric these are the boundaries of parotid mould or parotid bed so this is the location of parotid gland for color differentiation i will draw with a different color so here is the parotid gland then this parotid gland is covered by two layers that means two capsules one is true capsule another is false capsule right to show that i am taking the coronal section of parotid gland so that i can show you the two layers or two capsules of parotid gland this we have already studied in the investing layer of deep cervical fascia when you take the section at this level you can see cut section of ramus of the mandible here so this is the cut section of ramus of the mandible then here external acoustic meatus and here tympanic plate and here what is this process styloid process so parotid gland is located here so this is a parotid gland investing layer of deep cervical fascia when it reaches to the apex of parotid gland it splits into two layers and encloses the parotid gland is it or not so here 
it splits into two layers superficial layer attaching to the inferior border of the ramus of the mandible then deep layer is loose and attaching to the tympanic plate so here is tympanic plate then deep layer thicken to form one ligament that ligament is attaching to the styloid process on the angle of the mandible it separates the submandibular gland from the parotid gland what is this ligament stylo mandibular ligament this is the outer covering of the parotid gland this outer covering what we call false capsule so this false capsule is formed by investing layer of deep cervical fascia we know that investing layer of deep cervical fascia when it reaches to the apex of the parotid gland it splits into two layers and encloses the parotid gland by two layers superficial layer and deep layer superficial layer is covering the superficial surface of the parotid gland and also fuses with the epimysium of mesiotar muscle and forms thickest fascia what we call parotido mesiotric fascia so here is the parotido mesiotric fascia then deep layer is loose and attaching to the tympanic plate and here the part of this deep layer is thickened and forms a one ligament that ligament what we call stylo mandibular ligament so like this false capsule is covering the parotid gland then what about true capsule true capsule is nothing but condensation of connective tissue which is present within the gland that covers the gland that is what we call true capsule false capsule is formed by investing layer of deep cervical fascia but true capsule is formed by condensation of connective tissue which is present within the gland or the stroma of the gland which will be covering the parotid gland that is what we call true capsule coverings are two false capsule and true capsule false capsule is formed by the investing layer of deep cervical fascia true capsule is formed by the condensation of fibrous tissue or condensation of connective tissue which is present within the gland then if you take the size it is around 25 grams then what is the shape of it it is inverted pyramid shape this is a shape if it is inverted pyramid it is having base but it is directed upwards it is having apex it is directed downwards and it is having a anterior border posterior border so if you see from the surface view it is looking like pyramid only see here this is the base this is apex here is the anterior border here is the posterior border but if you take the transverse section also it is pyramidal in shape or triangular in shape that means anteriorly ramus of the mandible is there posteriorly mastoid process is there in between the mastoid process and ramus of the mandible gland will be invaginated deeper so that it will be having a surface which is in relation with the ramus of the mandible and surface which is present in relation with the mastoid process and these two surfaces are uniting or meeting at one point that is what we call border that border is medial border are you getting my point very simple when i take the section at this level you can easily understand the concept of different parts of parotid gland let me take that picture when i take the section at this level you can see the ramus of the mandible here this is the cut section of ramus of the mandible then here cut section of mastoid process then here you can see the cut section of thyroid process what are the attachments of this ramus of the mandible outside what is this muscle this muscle what is this mesiotar muscle so here is the mesiotar muscle if you see inside what is this muscle medial pterygoid muscle inside medial pterygoid muscle then if you see attachments of mastoid process what is the muscle which is attaching here what is this sternocleidomastoid so here is the sternocleidomastoid then deep to this there will be one groove in that groove there will be attachment of one muscle this muscle is posterior belly of digastric so here is the posterior belly of digastric and this is the sternocleidomastoid and since it is styloid process styloid process will be giving the attachment to the three muscles what are those stylo hyoid stylo glossus stylo pharyngeus if you go still more deeper some other structures will be present that will be surrounded by one sheath what is that sheath carotid sheath if it is carotid sheath what structures are present here here is the internal carotid artery here is vein internal jugular vein and the nerve is present which nerve is this 
vagus nerve. These are the genuine contents of carotid sheath. Along with that, some other nerves also present. That means last four cranial nerves are present within the carotid sheath in the upper part. Of course, they will be piercing and they comes out. Only vagus nerve will be remaining. But branches of vagus nerve, they pierces the carotid sheath and come out. That we have discussed in the last session. And if you go still more deeper, what is present? Here you can see the pharynx. So, here is pharynx. Now, gland is inyaginated in between the ramus of the mandible and mastoid passes. So, gland will be like this. Gland will be inyaginated like this. Because of that, this surface present in between the anterior border and the medial border. This surface, it is in relation with the ramus of the mandible. So, this surface what we call anteromedial surface, right? Then, this surface present in between the, this is the posterior border. In between the posterior border and the medial border. Here is the surface. This surface, what we call posteromedial surface. This is the posteromedial surface and here is the anteromedial surface. Then what is this surface? This is superficial surface or we can also call it as lateral surface. Now, this superficial surface is covered by first skin, then superficial fascia. Within the superficial fascia, there will be nerve. What is that nerve? Which is supplying to the skin over the parotid gland. Great auricular nerve. These are the section of great auricular nerve. Then along with that, there will be muscle. What is that muscle? Platysma muscle and also rhizorius muscle. After that, there will be some lymph nodes are present over it. So, those are superficial group of lymph nodes. Then, through the substance of the gland, some structures will be passing. What structures are passing through it? Here is the external carotid artery enters into the gland. When it reaches at the level of the neck of the mandible, it will be terminated by dividing into two branches. What are those branches? Maxillary artery, this is maxillary and another terminal branch is superficial temporal artery. Then, in the same manner, if there is maxillary artery, there will be maxillary vein also, right? So, here is the maxillary vein. Then, if it is superficial temporal artery, there will be superficial temporal vein also. So, here is superficial temporal vein. Here, superficial temporal vein and maxillary vein, both are united and forming the one vein, this vein what we call retromandibular vein. This retromandibular vein just above the apex, it will be divided into two branches. What are those? Anterior division of retromandibular vein and the posterior division of retromandibular vein. These structures present within the substance of the gland. So, here I am drawing in the deeper aspect, the external carotid artery. This is the cut section of the external carotid artery. Next, there will be vein. What is this vein? Retromandibular vein. This vein is retromandibular vein. Then, one more structure. In between the styloid process and mastoid process, there will be one foramen. What is that foramen? Stylomastoid foramen. From the stylomastoid foramen, there will be one nerve is emerging out. What is that nerve? For suppose, in between the styloid process and mastoid process, here only foramen is there. What is that foramen called? Stylomastoid foramen. From the stylomastoid foramen, nerve is emerging out. Which nerve is this? Facial nerve. So, this facial nerve emerging out. After emerging out, it pierces or it enters into the substance of the gland through the, what is the surface? Posteromedial surface. So, through the posteromedial surface, it enters into the gland. Then, after that, it passes through the substance of the gland. When it reaches to the anterior aspect, it comes out through the anteromedial surface. Of course, within the substance of the gland only, it will be divided into five branches okay, to supply the muscles of facial expression. Right? So, this is about the structures which are present in relation with the parotid gland in the transfer section. Then we will see the parotid gland from the side view. Of course, here I have drawn side view, but it is not that much clear. Because of that, I will take one more picture here. This is the, this is the side view and of course, you can see eye here. What is this? The external acoustic meatus. Here is your gland. 
This is the parotid gland. We have already studied that from the stylomastoid foramen, facial nerve is entering into the substance of the gland and within the substance of the gland it will be divided into five branches. But mainly it will be divided into two branches first. Let me show you that. As soon as entering into the gland, it will be divided into two branches first. One is temporofacial and cervicofacial. So, this is a temporofacial and here is the cervicofacial. Temporofacial is divided into two branches. This is temporal branch and here is the geogrammatic branch. Then, what is this branch? Cervicofacial. This cervicofacial will be divided into buccal branch, then marginal mandibular and here is the cervical. Of course, this buccal branch further divided into upper buccal and lower buccal. So, here is the upper buccal and here is lower buccal. So, what are the branches here? This is temporal branch. This is geogrammatic branch. This is upper buccal. This is lower buccal. In between the upper buccal and lower buccal, there will be duct. What is this duct? Perotid duct. Of course, one artery will be emerging out from the anterior border of the perotid gland. What is that? See here. This is superficial temporal, no? Superficial temporal artery will be giving one branch anteriorly. That is what we call transverse facial artery. So, here is transverse facial artery. Then, we will draw these structures also. What are these? Superficial temporal vessels and one nerve will be going like this. What is this? Auriculotemporal nerve. So, here we will draw auriculotemporal nerve. This is auriculotemporal nerve. Then, superficial temporal vein. Then, superficial temporal artery. Clear? Then, at the posterior part, you can see artery going like this. Posterior auricular artery along with nerve also. Of course, it is a branch from the facial nerve, posterior auricular nerve and posterior auricular artery. Now, we know that what is vein? Superficial temporal vein. Superficial temporal vein, after fusing with the maxillary vein, it will be forming the which vein is this? Retromandibular vein. This retromandibular vein will be divided into anterior and posterior divisions. So, this is the side view of parotid gland. Now, we will see what are the different presenting parts and their relations. It is pyramidal in shape when you see from the superficial surface. Because of that, it is having base, see here, this is the base from here to here. This is apex, here is anterior border, here is posterior border. And what is the surface? Superficial surface. Then if you see in the transverse section, it is having one surface in relation with the ramus of the mandible and its attachment. This surface what we call anteromedial surface. How it has formed? In between the ramus of the mandible and mastoid process, it has been extended deeper. So that this surface what we call anteromedial surface. This surface what we call posteromedial surface. And the surface which is present superficially, that means this surface, this surface, what we call superficial surface. Right? So, what are the presenting parts of parotid gland? It is having apex, this is apex. It is having base, this is base. It is having anterior border, this is anterior border. It is having posterior border. Right? What is this border in that sense? This is anterior border, this is posterior border. Right? Then medial border. Medial border is in relation with the pharynx. That is what this border we can also call as pharyngeal border. Then in between these borders, there will be surfaces. What are these surfaces? In between the anterior border and posterior border, this surface what we call superficial surface. Then in between the anterior border and the medial border, this surface what we call anteromedial surface. In between the posterior border and the medial border, this surface what we call posteromedial surface. Now we will discuss about relations of different presenting parts. First, if we take apex, see this part is apex. This apex is related with what? What is this branch? Cervical branch of facial nerve. Then, what is this? Anterior division and posterior division of retromandibular vein. Along with that, this apex will be related with the, this muscle. What is this muscle? Posterior belly of digastric. If you remember that much, that is sufficient. Cervical branch of facial nerve, anterior and posterior divisions of retromandibular vein, posterior belly of digastric. That is it about the relations of apex. Then, this is the base from here to here. What are the structures which are in relation with the base? See here, the external acoustic meatus. And then, what is this giant here? Temporomandibular giant. First, we will remember 
the external acoustic meatus and the temporomandibular joint. Then, what are these structures? Auricular temporal nerve, superficial temporal vessels, and temporal branch of facial nerve. These are the structures which are present in relation with the base. Very simple. The external acoustic meatus, temporomandibular joint, superficial temporal vessels, auricular temporal nerve, temporal branch of facial nerve. Clear? So, these are the relations of base. Then, what are the relations of anterior border? What are the relations of posterior border? When you are studying about relations of anterior border, what are the branches of facial nerve are remaining? See, cervical branch of facial nerve, it is related to the apex, it is over. Then, temporal branch of facial nerve related to the base, it is also over. Then, what are remaining? Geogomatic branch, buccal branch, of course, upper buccal and lower buccal marginal mandibular. So, middle three branches of facial nerve, then artery from the superficial temporal artery. What is this artery? Transverse facial artery. Then parotid duct. These are only relations of anterior border. Recollect once again from above downwards. Geogomatic branch of facial nerve, transverse facial artery. It is branched from the superficial temporal artery. Upper buccal, lower buccal. In between upper buccal and lower buccal, you can see the parotid duct or stenson's duct. Then marginal mandibular. Of course, if accessory gland is present along with its duct, we can see the structure here. Accessory gland or accessory parotid gland and its ducts. Recollect once again. Geogomatic branch, transverse facial artery, upper buccal nerve, parotid duct, lower buccal nerve, marginal mandibular. These are the anterior border relations. Right? Then, Posterior border relations. See, this posterior border is resting over the sternocleidomastoid. If you remember that much, that's sufficient. But still more, if you wanted to remember, you can remember these two structures also: posterior auricular vessels and nerves. These are the relations of anterior border and posterior border. Then what are remaining? Medial border. See, this is the medial border. Medial border is present in relation with what? What is this? This is the pharynx. So. Medial border is in relation with the pharynx. Then we have to see the relations of surfaces. What surfaces are there? This is the superficial surface. This surface is anteromedial surface. This surface is posteromedial surface. If you come into the superficial surface, first there will be skin. Once you remove the skin, you can see the superficial fascia. Within the superficial fascia, you can see the branches of great auricular. See here. Great auricular nerve will be coming out from here, from the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid, then it crosses over the muscle and it will be dividing and supplying to the skin over the parotid region and also auricle. What is this nerve? Great auricular. So, these are the branches of great auricular nerve. Right? Then what is this? From the parotidomesetric fascia, rhizorius muscle is taking origin. So, that superficially rhizorius muscle is there along with Insertion of platysma muscle. So, here platysma muscle and also rhizorius. Clear? Then superficial parotid group of lymph nodes. These are the relations of superficial surface. Recollect once again. Skin, superficial fascia. Within the superficial fascia, branches of great auricular nerve, otherwise anterior branch of great auricular nerve. Then platysma and rhizorius muscle superficial parotid group of lymph nodes. After that, what you can see? This fascia. What is that fascia? Parotidomesetric fascia. Here is parotidomesetric fascia. These are the relations of superficial surface. Recollect once again. Skin, superficial fascia. Within the superficial fascia, great auricular nerve, platysma and rhizorius, superficial parotid group of lymph nodes, then parotidomesetric fascia. That's it. Then coming to the anteromedial surface. This is the anteromedial surface. What are the relations of it? What is this? Ramus of the mandible. Outside the ramus of the mandible, mesetar. Inside the ramus of the mandible, medial tergoid muscle. Anteromedial surface relations. Simply remember that ramus of the mandible and its attachments. What are these attachments? Outside mesetar muscle, inside medial tergoid muscle. Along with that, see here is the nerve. What is this nerve? Facial nerve. Facial nerve will be emerging out from this surface. Clear? Then, here, what is this? Posterior part of the 
temporomandibular joint. So, these are the relations of anteromedial surface. Recollect once again, ramus of the mandible, mesiotar muscle, medial tergate muscle, facial nerve, temporomandibular joint. These are the anteromedial surface relations. Then coming to the posteromedial surface. Posteromedial surface in relation with the mastoid process and its attachments, styloid process and its attachments, carotid sheath and its contents. Only three sentences you remember. If you take mastoid process and its attachments, what are these? Sternocleidomastoid, posterior bilia of digastric. Then styloid process and its attachments. Styloid process, stylohyoid, stylopharynges, styloglasses. Then carotid sheath and its contents. Internal jugular vein, internal carotid artery and last four cranial nerves. Then what is this? Facial nerve. Along with that if you wanted to write still more, transverse process of atlas also you can write. So these are the relations of posteromedial surface. Recollect once again. Mastoid process and its attachments. That means sternocleidomastoid, mastoid process, posterior bilia of digastric. Styloid process and its attachments. Styloid process, then stylohyoid, stylopharynges, styloglasses. Carotid sheath and its contents. Internal carotid artery, internal jugular vein, last four cranial nerves. Since it is in the upper part, but in the lower part of the carotid sheath, only vagus nerve is present. Transverse process of atlas. Along with transverse process, rectus lateral is also related with this. Then facial nerve. These are the relations of posterior medial surface, right. Then what are the structures which are present within the substance of the gland? We have already studied, what is this? External carotid artery, then formation of retromandibular vein and division of retromandibular vein. How retromandibular vein will form? Superficial temporal maxillary, united and forms a retromandibular. At the lower part of the gland, it will be divided into anterior division and posterior division. So, this is retromandibular vein, right. Actually, external carotid artery will be passing through the gland and when it reaches at the level of the neck of the mandible, it will be divided into two terminal branches. One is maxillary, another is superficial temporal artery. Then any other structures are present within the substance of the gland, see, this is the nerve, facial nerve. Facial nerve, after emerging out from the stylomastoid foramen, it descends down around 1 centimeter, then it enters into the gland. Within the gland, it will be divided into two branches, temporofacial, cervicofacial. These branches will be emerging out from the gland as goose foot. Because of that, that arrangement what we call pes anserinus. It is looking like goose foot. That's what this arrangement what we call pes anserinus. These are the structures which are present within the substance of the gland. Very simple. External carotid artery, retromandibular vein, facial nerve. These are the structures which are present within the substance of the gland. So, these are the different presenting parts and their relations. Now, we will discuss little about parotid duct. Then we will go for blood supply, nerve supply and lymphatic drainage then applied aspects. See here, this is the parotid duct. It is emerging out from the anterior border of parotid gland in between the upper buccal and lower buccal. Let me draw here. It is emerging out like this. Then it is passing over this muscle. What is this muscle? Mesiotar muscle. It is passing over the mesiotar muscle. When it reaches to the anterior border of the mesiotar muscle, it take abrupt turn towards medial side. Then it pierces three Bs. It is not blood brain barrier. First one is buccal pad of fat, buccinator muscle, buccopharyngeal fascia. It pierces these three structures, three Bs. What are those? Buccal pad of fat, buccinator muscle, buccopharyngeal fascia. It pierces these structures. Then it runs obliquely in between the buccinator muscle and oral mucosa for some distance. Then when it reaches to the crown of upper second molar tooth, when it reaches at the level of crown of upper second molar tooth, it pierces the mucous membrane and opens into the vestibule of oral cavity. Right? Of course, there will be papillae. Over that papillae, it will be opening. This duct what we call parotid duct or we can also call it as Stenson's duct. Clear? Very simple. Let me tell you one more time. From the anterior border of the parotid gland, parotid duct will be emerging in between the upper buccal and lower buccal. Then it passes or it runs over the mesiotar muscle. When it reaches anterior border of the mesiotar muscle, it takes abrupt turn towards medial side. Then it pierces three Bs. What are three Bs? Buccal pad of fat, buccinator muscle, buccopharyngeal fascia. Then it runs obliquely for some distance in between the buccinator muscle and the mucous membrane. 
then it reaches at the level of the crown of upper second molar tooth where it pierces the mucous membrane and opens into the vestibule of oral cavity because of this abrupt turn and the oblique passes when you are blowing air or when you are blowing the balloon this duct is not inflating otherwise this duct will be inflated why it is not inflating even though you are blowing the air because it is taking abrupt turn and also oblique passes this oblique passes acting as wall to prevent the entry of air but it is the passes for the oral infection to the parotid gland because it is communicated with the oral cavity because of that through this parotid duct infections may spread from the oral cavity to the parotid gland so this is about the parotid duct or we can also call as stenson's duct now we will see what are the processes of parotid gland see here we have already studied from the parotid gland there will be one forward extension this forward extension what we call accessory parotid gland that process or that projection what we call accessory process right sometimes it will be present or it will be projected over the face that process what we call facial process then there will be process which will be projecting along the carotid artery this process what we call carotid process then there will be some projection or some process which is present behind the temporomandibular joint here this process what we call glenoid process then here this is the stylar process in front of the stylar process there will be one projection that is what we call pre stylite process then this is medial pterygoid muscle this is the ramus of the mandible in between the ramus of the mandible and medial pterygoid muscle there will be one small projection will be like this this projection what we call pterygoid process right so these are the different processes very simple glenoid process carotid process pterygoid process pre stylite process accessory process facial process these are the different processes of parotid gland now we will discuss about blood supply lymphatic drainage and nerve supply if you take the blood supply see here within the substance of the gland blood vessels are there so external carotid artery supplying to the parotid gland venous blood from the parotid gland will be draining into the retromandibular vein then lymphatic drainage see here superficial to the parotid gland there will be some lymph nodes those lymph nodes what we call superficial parotid group of lymph nodes then within the substance also some lymph nodes will be there these are what we call deep parotid group of lymph nodes both superficial and deep parotid group of lymph nodes will be draining the lymph from the parotid gland efferents from these lymph nodes draining into the jugulodigastric lymph node so this is about the lymphatic drainage then we will discuss about nerve supply parotid gland will be supplied by both sympathetic and parasympathetic first if you take the sympathetic nerves for that i am taking the transverse section of spinal cord see here this is the spinal cord and here posterior grahan here anterior grahan and here central canal this is the spinal cord cord section for suppose this is at the level of t1 this is at the level of t2 actually in case of thoracic segments along with anterior horn and posterior horn there will be lateral horns also so here lateral horns preganglionic fibers of sympathetic nerves preganglionic sympathetic neurons will be present which are supplying to the parotid gland are present in the t1 and t2 spinal segments that to where in the lateral horns so for suppose they are present here from there axons through anterior root they comes out on either side of the spinal cord there will be chain what is the chain called sympathetic chain so here this is the sympathetic chain of course in the cervical region it shows three ganglions superior middle and inferior cervical ganglions right of course here thoracic ganglion should be present so what is this sympathetic chain these three ganglionic fibers they enter into the sympathetic chain but they will not rely in the same level they ascends within the sympathetic chain and they reaches to superior cervical ganglion they reaches where superior cervical ganglion so here after that post ganglionic fibers will be arising that means 
within the superior cervical ganglion post ganglionic neurons will be present from there axons comes out from the ganglion and forms plexus around the carotid system that means they forms plexus around the external carotid artery let me draw the external carotid artery here so this is the common carotid artery and here internal carotid artery this is the external carotid artery I am cutting the internal carotid here only. So, this is the external carotid. External carotid will be giving different branches here. This is the maxillary artery, terminal branches. This is the superficial temporal and this is the maxillary artery. Here is our parotid gland. Now, post ganglionic fibers from the superior cervical ganglion, they comes out and forms the plexus around the external carotid artery and they supplies to the parotid gland. They form the plexus around the external carotid artery and they reaches to the parotid gland and they supplies. That is about the sympathetic innervation. Now, we will discuss about parasympathetic innervation. Parasympathetic innervation of parotid gland is very important because it is in relation with the otic ganglion. Right? For that, I am taking the sagittal section of cranial cavity because I wanted to show you few nerves and their relations and middle ear cavity and also mandibular nerve how it is entering into the infratemporal fossa. It will take little time but it works. This is the anterior cranial cavity, here is middle cranial cavity and here is posterior cranial cavity. Right? So, if you take the only cavity it will be like this. So, this is the cranial cavity. Here you can see the orbit, this is roof. Here is floor, medial wall, lateral wall, right? This is orbit and here is maxilla. Here teeth will be present and here is mandible. I am drawing roughly. So, here bone is present, right? What is this? This is the anterior cranial fossa, this is middle cranial fossa and here is the posterior cranial fossa. And of course, here mandible will be there. This we have cut here for our convenience. In the posterior cranial fossa, you can see midbrain here, here pons and here medulla oblongata. So, here midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata. Behind cerebellum will be present. Clear? Now, within the pons, you can found the nucleus called inferior salivatory nucleus. So, here inferior salivatory nucleus. Preganglionic parasympathetic neurons to supply the parotid gland are present within the inferior salivatory nucleus only. So, here neurons are present. Axons from these neurons comes out through what? Through the ninth cranial nerve or glossopharyngeal nerve. Let me show you that. Here is the glossopharyngeal nerve. Let me draw here one foramen. What is this foramen? This is the jugular foramen. Through the jugular foramen, ninth cranial nerve will comes out. Ninth cranial nerve comes out through the jugular foramen. Of course, it shows two dilatations those what we call superior and inferior ganglions. Then after that where it supplies? It supplies to stylopharyngeus muscle and it also supplies to carotid sinus and carotid body. That and all not necessary in this session. Only thing is preganglionic fibers which are present in the inferior salivatory nucleus. They pass through the which nerve? Glossopharyngeal nerve. Then at the level of inferior ganglion. Imagine here is superior ganglion, here inferior ganglion. At the level of inferior ganglion, it comes out. That means this nerve will give branch, that branch what we call tympanic branch. Through the tympanic branch, these preganglionic fibers will be passing. This nerve we can also call as nerve of Jacobson or Jacobson's nerve. It passes through one small canaliculus and reaches to the middle ear cavity. What is that canaliculus called? Tympanic canaliculus. Through the tympanic canaliculus, it passes and reaches to one box here. What is this box? I am drawing one box here. What is this? Middle ear cavity. It reaches to middle ear cavity. Over the medial wall of the middle ear cavity, this nerve, that means this tympanic nerve will form a plexus. That plexus what we call tympanic plexus. So, here it enters into the middle ear cavity and forms a plexus. That plexus what we call tympanic plexus. Right? From that tympanic plexus, nerve will be arising that nerve what we call lesser petrosal nerve. So, here this is the 
lesser petrosal nerve. From here, lesser petrosal nerve enters into the cranial cavity. It enters into the cranial cavity through the hiatus for the lesser petrosal nerve. Now, it is waiting within the middle cranial fossa. Now, it has to reach otic ganglion. Otic ganglion present in the infratemporal fossa. So, these nerve fibers has to reach infratemporal fossa. Now, it is searching for the door to reach the infratemporal fossa. So, at that time, there will be one nerve is entering into the infratemporal fossa through one foramen. What is that foramen called? Foramen ovale. So, through this foramen ovale, mandibular nerve is entering into the infratemporal fossa. So, mandibular nerve is entering into the infratemporal fossa. So, along with mandibular nerve, it jumps or it enters into the foramen ovale. So, now it is reaching to the foramen ovale. Now, in between the mandibular nerve and tensor velar palatine, that means mandibular nerve laterally, medially tensor velar palatine. In between these two structures, there is ganglion. That ganglion, what we call otic ganglion. So, here I am drawing otic ganglion. This is otic ganglion. Let me draw otic ganglion with different color. This is the otic ganglion. Okay. Actually, it is present medial to the nerve. But if I draw medial to the nerve, I cannot show you. That's what I am drawing little in front. So, this is which ganglion? Otic ganglion. Now, this mandibular nerve having one branch. That is what we call auriculotemporal nerve. So, I am drawing the auriculotemporal nerve. This is mandibular nerve. Mandibular nerve giving auriculotemporal. So, this is auriculotemporal nerve. This auriculotemporal nerve is supplying to the auricle and also temporal region along with parotid gland. This is auriculotemporal nerve. Here, I cannot draw the parotid gland. That is what I am stretching this. Actually, it is a now it is schematic diagram. It is taking this auriculotemporal nerve behind and here this is the parotid gland. It is going like this. These preganglionic fibers up to where they reach? They reach into the infratemporal fossa through the foramen ovale. Right? Now, these fibers they reaches to otic ganglion. They reaches to otic ganglion now. Within the otic ganglion, relay will take place. Relay means what? This preganglionic fibers ends, post ganglionic fibers start. Now, post ganglionic fibers from this otic ganglion pass through this nerve. What is this nerve? Auriculotemporal nerve. And they pass along with the auriculotemporal nerve and they supply to the parotid gland. That means they give secretomotor fibers to the parotid gland. This is the parasympathetic root or secretomotor root to the parotid gland. Let me tell you one more time. Inferior salivary nucleus present in the palms. It contains preganglionic secretomotor neurons. Axons of these preganglionic neurons pass through the glossopharyngeal nerve. Then they pass through the tympanic branch of glossopharyngeal nerve or Jacobson's nerve. Then they reaches to the middle ear cavity. Over the medial wall of the middle ear cavity, it forms a plexus. That plexus what we call tympanic plexus. From the tympanic plexus, lesser petrosal nerve will be arising. That lesser petrosal nerve enters into the infratemporal fossa or reaches to the infratemporal fossa through the foramen ovale. Then within the infratemporal fossa, medial to the mandibular nerve, there is a ganglion. That ganglion what we call otic ganglion. Within the otic ganglion, relay will take place. Then post ganglionic fibers arising from the otic ganglion are post ganglionic neurons are present within the otic ganglion. Axons of those neurons pass through the auriculotemporal nerve and reaches to the parotid gland and supplies secretomotor innervation to the parotid gland. So, this is about the parasympathetic innervation or parasympathetic nerve supply. This is sympathetic innervation, this is parasympathetic innervation. Now, just I will tell the terms or the terminology which you have to remember in relation with the parasympathetic innervation. Inferior salivatory nucleus, ninth cranial nerve, tympanic nerve, tympanic plexus, lesser petrosal nerve, otic ganglion, auriculotemporal nerve, parotid gland. This is about the parasympathetic innervation. With this, we have studied grass anatomy of parotid gland. Now, we will discuss about applied aspects. This is the peritonomesetric fascia. That means, superficial layer of investing layer of deep cervical fascia, it is covering the superficial surface and also covering the mesetar muscle. That is what this fascia what we call peritonomesetric fascia. This is very tightly adherent. Because of that, any accumulations or any swelling of peritonomesetric gland which leads to severe pain because of the increasing tension. 
any swelling of the parotid gland is more painful. Then, because of the mumps virus, parotid gland will be infected. Usually, the mumps infection of parotid gland may spread to the pancreas and also testis. Because of that, any patient comes to the doctor with sterility. Sterility means sperm count will be very less or no, so that they cannot give contribution to the fertilization, which leads to sterility. Right? So, if any patient comes to the doctor with sterility, they will ask some questions in that they will ask whether you have infected with the mumps virus or whether you have suffered with mumps. Because mumps virus will affect the pancreas and also testis. If it is affecting the pancreas, that is what we call pancreatitis. If it is affecting the testis, that is what we call arcaditis, which leads to sterility. So, that is about the mumps virus. Then, see here, this is parotid gland. This is the parotid duct. Any infections in the oral cavity, they may spread to the parotid gland through the parotid duct, which leads to abscess sometimes. Abscess means what? Formation of pus in the parotid region. That is what we call parotid abscess. In case of parotid abscess, you have to drain the pus. When you are draining the pus, if you make incision like this, vertical incision, what will you do? Instead of draining the pus, you will make the patient Bell's palsy patient. Why? You will be cutting the facial. That's what, what you have to do. You have to make horizontal incision that to very small, small holes. Horizontal incision you have to give. So, giving this horizontal incision, what we call Hilton's method. So, you have to follow the Hilton's method. You have to make horizontal incision to avoid cutting the facial nerve. Clear? So, this method what we call Hilton's method. So, in case of facial abscess, you have to drain the pus. When you are draining the pus, you have to follow the Hilton's method. Hilton's method is nothing but making horizontal incision, not vertical incision. If you make the horizontal incision, you will not cut the facial nerve. Then, one more applied aspect here. See, this is the facial nerve, which is passing through the narrowest part of the parotid gland. This narrowest part, what we call isthmus. Deep to the isthmus, this is what we call deep lobe. Superficial to the systemus, what we call superficial lobe. That means it is having two lobes, deep lobe and superficial lobe connected by isthmus. Through that isthmus, facial nerve is passing. During removal of parotid gland, surgeons will work along with this nerve. That means along with the isthmus and they remove the parotid gland so that they will not cut the facial nerve. Is that clear? This is one more applied aspect. Next one is Frey syndrome. Frey syndrome or gestatory sweating. Gestatory sweating means what? When you are eating anything, along with salivary secretion, there will be sweating over the parotid gland. That means, here parotid gland is there, over that skin is there. Over the skin, there will be sweating along with salivation. That syndrome what we call Frey syndrome. Why it will happen? See here, these are the branches of great auricular nerve. And here, you can see the nerve auriculotemporal nerve. In case of penetrating wounds or during the parotid surgeries, these nerves, great auricular nerve and auriculotemporal nerve, these nerves will be injured and again they will be regenerated. During regeneration, parasympathetic nerve fibers which are passing through the auriculotemporal nerve, they connected with the great auricular nerve. So, along with supplying to the parotid gland, they will be supplying to the sweat glands over the parotid region. Let me tell you that. For suppose, these are the sympathetic neurons and these are the parasympathetic neurons. These sympathetic neurons are supplying to the sweat glands. So, this is the sweat gland and these are the parasympathetic nerve fibers. These parasympathetic nerve fibers are supplying to the parotid gland. Now, here wound happened, penetrating wound happened. After that, again it has been regenerated. During regeneration, these fibers, these parasympathetic fibers connected with the sympathetic fibers and they are innervating the sweat glands. Whenever we eat food or we get any good smell of food, we will get the saliva. That means salivary glands will be stimulated and saliva will be produced. See here, these nerves, they are supplying to the parotid gland and parotid gland will secrete. No problem here. But these nerve fibers, they are supplying to the sweat glands also. Because of that, along with saliva, sweating over the parotid region. This is what we call Frey syndrome. Then, there will be some tumors, parotid tumors. 
if it is benign tumor growth will be slow and facial nerve will not be affected if it is malignant growth will be faster and facial nerve will be affected next silolithiasis silolithiasis means what lithiasis means what formation of stones within the parotid duct there will be formation of stones that is because of precipitation of saliva because of that those stones what we call silolithiasis right to detect that silolithiasis usually they will introduce contrast dye into the parotid duct and they take the x ray right that procedure what we call silogram what is that procedure called silogram so that we can found any obstruction is there or any stricture is there within the parotid duct so these are the few applied aspects related to the parotid gland that's it about the parotid gland now i will give you the summary of parotid gland